I mic'd down just a touch because it was a little loud in there. And that should even out the audio between the two of them. I tweet that awesome. out. Awesome. And let's just make sure it's like seeing this. Starting. Cool. All right. There we go. Um, let me give you a copy of the uh, thing here. I'll just DM it to you, and you can send that out on uh, yours. Because it'll be going live, but I'm going to have an archive up uh, of the audio, maybe the video too, depending on the size of the file. What's with Twitter's DM not refreshing when you're in the window? That's so dumb. I don't have a problem with that in TweetDeck, but I do have issue with that in Twitter proper. I really like TweetDeck. If you haven't used it, you should really give it a try. Yeah, I really want to get some more. Um, I want to get more savvy with Twitter, to be quite honest, because it, it's it's weird. It's so touchy and it's so powerful, but then it's like if you don't use it right, it sucks. It's, it's one of those things. I'm really trying to get into it. Yeah, it's um a little peculiar, but once you get the hang of it, it's not too bad. I hate the fact that I have to use Facebook so much. I hate Facebook a lot. Ah, uh, it's vile. It is. It is. It's uh, it's changed the world for the worst. <laughs> I I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the it's, way I that mean, it's it... run, as opposed to uh, the way that Twitter was run until it's kind of hit its uh quirkiness lately. Yeah, it, I hate. I, I don't know what it's. I don't understand how how Facebook took over the world, but it did, and uh, it sucks. <laughs> I absolutely agree with you, completely. All right, so, so are we are we streaming yet? It says it's live. The stream health isn't great, but that's fine. So you know, whatever, we're good. So hey, let's awesome. make it happen. All right, so I guess since uh, we don't want to make this a complete blah of last time, what I'll do here is uh, I've got all the audio queued up from uh, what you've sent me and also from the uh, stuff you sent me specifically for this. So we'll queue up um, something from Acromatic Residue. We'll do the uh, Sunlight on My Souls bit here. Nice. So this is the uh, the remix. This is my remix of this song right here. It was called the uh, Kinsentra Clip Off Remix. And with the uh, balances we have now, we should be able to just uh, comfortably talk over this and let it go in the background so people can get a feel of the music and, uh, you know, we can still nice. keep this going. Yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> yeah, I wanted, I wanted a real dancier version of, of the chromatic residue song to kind of see what uh, what the market would be like with this stuff kind of coming upbeat. Yeah, well there's always going to be a market for an upbeat, uh, upbeat tempo kind of thing. Yeah, the there nature is, of there is. Yeah, I, I, think, I think people are, would get into darker music if they were able to ease into it. Yeah, you're looking at kind of a uh, real specific scene, really, when you get into anything on the uh, the whole dark wave scene. Basically, is like you're looking at old goths or uh, kids that listen to industrial, you know, that kind of thing. You don't really pull from the uh, same kind of crowd. Like you don't really grab that house crowd. Yeah, <clears throat> but you know, I remember when like. All of these genres didn't exist proper like that. It's weird. It's weird how there's dream wave and, and this and that and that and the other. Yeah. And it's weird how shoegaze became a thing. <laughs> oh, I've only heard of that. Shoegaze. That's great. It used to just be college rock. <laughs> ah, this is what I get for staying out of. Uh, well, I don't. I don't miss being out of college rock scenes. I'm not missing anything. There. I, you know, I was pretty active in the college rock scene up until about 2005, and then it just became uh, mandolins and banjos. Yeah. 
<laughs> after a while. Yeah, that can be okay. The banjos. It can be, but you know, you can devolve into a really poor, poor imitation of fish in uh, no it's time true. flat. Very, very true. Fish were a Bela Fleck too. Another, another poor imitation of, of Bela Fleck as well. Yeah, I'm waiting for the research and stuff, uh, Dave Matthews and the like. That one's been a long yeah, time I mean, coming. I'm pessimistic about something like that happening again. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't think a Dave Matthews could ever exist again in the current frame of things in music right now. I mean, of course, grassroots it could. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's people that are going to like any kind of music, but uh, corporate music right now is just not around that kind of thing. I mean, they're around, like, uh, oh, who is it? The, the ones with the giant hair and the giant tits and the giant hips. It doesn't even matter what their names yeah. are because they come and go every day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the problem with Dave Matthews' band is that they weren't photogenic. Oh, not at whatsoever. all. They, uh, and I think that was, I thought that was cool because it made people listen to the music and they liked it. Well, absolutely. And the music was, you know, pretty thick with, with a lot of great musicians in the band. Yeah, and yeah. there was actually something to be said in the content of their music as well. You know, it wasn't just pop crap. There was actually a message of at least some that. No, there was. There was. It was, really, it was the demographics fault or the fans fault that, that got in with it that became the, the frat boy douchebag soundtrack and it's weird because that's i think it's ironic because he really wasn't anything like that absolutely no i mean if you listen to the music on uh, on content it's well it you know goes from style to style i mean a story is a story depending on how you're doing your music so i don't know exactly where i'm going with that just kind of rambling. <laughs> no, but, you, you, I mean, he wasn't really like a... Uh, like you say, it kind of fell into that anthem, but that's not really an accurate way to describe it. No, not at all. Not content -wise. Nothing like that. Alright, so we're uh, fading out here, and so as not to let this go into the next one, I'll just kind of boot that down That track also features... Um, that track also features uh, the artist Bedtime Stories, a.k.a. Thomas Shinji from uh, Paris, a Parisian-based producer. He featured, he was featured on the vocals for that one. He has, he has very uh, fascinating vocal uh, concepts because he's very much into this operatic uh, falsetto voice and then at the same time wants to be brutal uh, and, and kind of do these black metal squeals and light black metal. I wouldn't say it's proper black metal but still these black metal-esque squeals and screams and stuff and it's really fascinating because that was probably the most violent uh vox that i've heard from him he usually is very pleasant <laughs> i loved it but it was it was usually it's not that brutal when i heard that i was like is that is that fucking shinji oh my god that's awesome so yeah shout out to thomas shinji bedtime stories shinji and also his new moniker lynn Cool. Well, yeah, no, it's got a good style to it. I dig it. I wonder if we've got any uh, viewers this time around. Hey, we've actually picked somebody up. Sweet. Hello. Where Hi, you viewer. <laughs> you can put some text in the uh, thing on the Jigger All Catch and we uh, check it if you feel like chatting. Make a comment. Talk about it. <laughs> yeah, we got no moderators. Oh, well. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Wow, Zing. we just went in. We just went in deep, didn't we? Yeah, two feet. <laughs> as right. long as no one, as long as no one copy and pastes this to 4chan, then we'll be okay. Okay, I'll take the views, man. <laughs> if it's from Moo, maybe. <laughs> if yeah, it's from yeah, Moo, just totally. don't put it in. Don't put it in B. That's all. Yeah, and if you're gonna post Moo this X. to a to a chan, take it to eight chan. There are, there are good people over there. I'll hang out. I actually have content yeah. to provide. Might not be good. I have something to provide. <laughs> Shout out to Hot Wheels. What's going on? Yeah, yeah. Keep those wheels burning, son. 
All right, so I guess to uh, touch on a topic you had said before, I do actually agree with you in the way that uh, a lot of these um, people are attacking language. It really is uh, in and above the attacks on free speech directly. That is a, uh, a really excellent roundabout way of going about uh, your ends, you might say. Yeah, I, th I think um, I think it's a logical progression. I don't think it's, uh, it's something I agree with, but it's a logical progression uh, with where we're going, I think, as a species. Um, as, as, as we become more and more paradigm dependent on with our language and our and linguistics and our constructs that we make, it was only a matter of time before uh, I think people became either aware of it or concerned with it and with whatever agenda they had uh, that would flavor it as well. Yeah, I, I, um, I've always seen people as, uh, and I could be wrong, but I've always seen people as, as kind of um, inside of constructs linguistic, that, that have been linguistically created. Um, and, and then you kind of live there. While you're, it's like you're in a bubble though. You're going through a reality, but you have this bubble around you um, that has a windshield. And it's only as big and wide as the language that is being used, I think. That's kind of how I feel about it. I think it's also how a lot of um, old school, old days occultists saw it too, though. Um, even all the way down to the, the hermetic Greek guys from way, way back when. I think they saw that too. I think humans have always seen language as some kind of either dangerous or freeing, powerful tool for, for human beings. Well, there's wisdom in that. You know, that is the nature of language. I mean, it uh, it's a tool. And uh, like any tool, it can be used for good or ill. So it's a matter of how you're going to yeah, decide to do that sort of thing. It's like ancient Egypt, you know. The the, the uh, readers and writers were, were from a class at one point. I mean, they literally kept it away from people, common people. I mean, they had to have seen something in it to make them want to censor it as much. And I think that that's just haunted us forever. Like yeah, it's no. always haunted us as, as a species, as a civiliza civilization, I think, too. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And that's just going to... Well, those kind of things drag us down. And you know what? I've got yeah. an idea here. I'm going to share a link to this with the uh, guys on the radio station, because apparently one of our DJs isn't able to uh, broadcast. I think his show goes on right about now, so maybe we can get some folks to tune in from there. Tune in. Yeah, Man, yeah, we're gonna talk about crazy shit. Yeah, totally. Just absolutely whatever goes on. Uh, we got about an hour to chat. You say you don't have to worry about anything till about seven, right? Yeah, actually, I can go on a little bit later if that's okay, uh, because I, I had a cancellation. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm in I had... no particular rush. I've uh, had some good news lately. I actually had uh, two copyright things thrown against me for uh, music from Hotline Miami too, and they were dismissed. Uh, what within twelve hours? Do you know who the um, the artists were, or are you at liberty to discuss who the artists were? I don't think it would be had... an issue if I did. I mean, it's common knowledge from the uh, from the individual ones. Let me uh, send this link, and I'll hop over there and find out real quickly here. I know one was from Idol, I think. Oh, that's not the band, but that's the uh, the one. I think one might be a uh, perturbator. Ah, yeah, you'll definitely get one from that. No hate either to Perturbator. It's not like that. It's just he's he's the uh, he's the hot flavor of the month right now. So yeah, yeah no, you definitely get a, a strike from that. Oh crap! I just <clears throat> sent that to you. <laughs> <laughs> you right. know, I've never actually played that game before. I was never aware of the uh, video game side of um, Synthwave. I mean, I was aware spiritually of it, but I wasn't aware of the actual titles that were being created, you know, in the here and now, that was featuring all of it. Made there's sense, a there's a I driving think, game. Uh, oh, what is the name of that? Um, there's Power Drive 2000, which is going to be a really yeah. cool looking game. But there's another one. I've, I've seen a couple of people discuss uh, who are on the project of that. And I've seen a couple of discussions on that before. I actually know a couple of people who... Uh, 
who are going to be uh, contributing to that. Now, that was a couple of months ago, maybe, so I don't know if they still are or not, so I'll withhold their names, but uh, yeah, I, I knew a couple of people that, are, that have a couple of tracks that were going to be on there. Yeah, it looks no pretty problem. slick, too. I think it's got a, uh, what is it, a uh, Countach and a uh, DeLorean so far, which, you know, it's perfect. <laughs> the other one, why can I not find this thing? I don't know why the they haven't made a car, like a, a modern car, but in the in the body shape of a DeLorean, or at least mod it of some kind. Actually, you can buy DeLoreans today. I shit you not. The uh, the company that had wow. bought up all the parts basically went worldwide and found every part everywhere. Got them all into one place, and you can you can get a DeLorean assembled for I think like thirty to thirty three thousand. That's not bad. As no, as not really. Shut down on you. Yeah, that's not bad at all. I don't. You know what? I know nothing about the actual DeLorean car as a as a machine. I wonder what it would have been like to work on one. <clears throat> I would assume it would be shitty to work on, but I don't know. My suspicions tell me that. Okay, I found the other one. I found an image anyway. Let's see if it's got the name of the thing. Hmm. Something with a tank. That's certainly not it. <laughs> There's another Need for Speed game. No way. Is there really? That's what this They're is. They're gonna saying. make those until. They're going to make it until it crashes and burns, just like Call of Duty. <laughs> They're just going to keep going. Yeah, but they don't even put out something really good like a Gran Turismo, you know? They hardly no, they, try. I mean, I, I'm not that familiar with racing games per se, but, I mean, of course I remember that. That, that was a game changer when it came out. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Huge game changer. It still is, basically, with every, uh, every release that comes out. It's basically it's just... True. Uh, enhancing on the brand i mean they've actually got car damage and all that in there now i haven't played one in you quite a while miss, but, you know i missed the i missed the revolution i missed the revolution of uh, a new console that revolutionized a game you know and then wanting to play the the franchise once it hit that console I yeah you just that. don't it, have it, that anymore no that absolutely no, like there was no, no uh, even on even on the same console there's there's not even kind of a, a push to to make it different that different you know I, I think there's a couple that do that maybe of course fallout 3 and, and new vegas were worlds apart um and i think i mean i guess you know new vegas and fallout 4 are worlds apart but Fallout 4 is a lot like fallout 3 it's revamped have you got to play fallout 4 yet I have not. I'm actually waiting for a couple of mods, also the money to play it, but or buy it, but uh, I'm waiting for a mod to put in uh, the special system and uh, the skill system, because I'm not going to play a Fallout game without those two things. And I sent you a link to the uh, Drift Stage game, and it it's so cool. It looks like uh, an old Sega racing game. Nice. Um, yeah, I... I played Fallout 4 on the, the PS4 until my PS4 stopped working, and now it's mm. uh, disassembled, and I have to try to fix it. So there mm, we go. Good times. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it sucks when you're in the middle of either production or making uh, an album uh, for someone else on your label or anything like that because then you have zero time or will to want to take apart a PS4 and fix it whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. And that's not exactly... Well, I mean, you can send it off, but then who knows if they're going to fix it, what they're going to charge you, anything else. Exactly, exactly. Well, I think, what, what PS4, earlier this year or, la or late last year, there was some error that happened after a, uh, an update for some people's consoles, and it bricked, and they were like, yeah, send it in, and then pay 125 bucks plus shipping and handling, we'll fix it. Whew. I was like, what the fuck? That's pretty That's serious. Really shitty. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no wonder people hack you. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no wonder. Yeah, that will pretty much do it. I mean, you're uh, you're gouging people that bad. Then again, you know, Sony. Uh, I'm not gonna say they can do no wrong, but 
you know, they did better than Microsoft on their reveal on this console generation. No, they sure did. They actually really did. Um, <clears throat> I, you know, it was, a, I was, of course, PS1, PS2. Um, I came late to the PS3, but I really appreciated it. But I was, uh, when, the, when the Xbox came out, I was a late adopter to the Xbox, the original one, and then the Xbox 360, I was an early adopter to until I went through two of them that bricked with, the, of course, the Red Ring of Death. And then, um, then I was like, oh, fuck it. I'm just going to PlayStation. At least I can play online for free. And then I kind of got sold on it, and then I went straight for the PS4 after that because I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to relive the, the Microsoft era again. <laughs> yeah, they've got a – they're a little notorious for having uh, reliability issues where the PlayStations are generally a little bit more reliable. But, you know, that's going to come from a company being in that business for a, a little longer. It's true. It, that and <clears throat> I think um, mechanically they're great, but network-wise, that's where the big gaping hole is right now with them. They're constantly shut down. Not just that, constantly shut down and, and <clears throat> leaving transparent holes to grab people's data from. That's the crazy part. Yeah, and that's a big, big thing these days, too. You know, because... yeah with as transparent as people are online and as completely thoughtless as they can be and how they handle their affairs it's uh operational security is a thing that every person that does anything on the internet should do and it's something that it's not but a handful even bother trying it's true it's absolutely true but then you when you if you really keep up with with things, it starts to freak you out how much shit is vulnerable every day. Was the the newest thing that new is maybe two weeks old, but the newest thing is the wireless mouses. Able to you're able to to uh, key log and all kinds of shit for just from people's wireless mouses, and it's like almost every one of them are vulnerable. Really, it's crazy. Huh. Yeah, it, it, that came out in the like I think a week and a half or two weeks ago. That uh, they there's a bunch of people have found a way to to pretty much go into your system via a, a port that the wireless mouse is, is using. Wow. I'm like, Jesus. That's the first I've heard of that. That is insane. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. I, I use a wireless mouse, and I just, I'm like, well, damn. I don't, and I think I'm going to keep on making a point of that. Right. <laughs> it's just it's so nice to, like, lay on the floor <laughs> and browse <laughs> and browse your computer on a big screen, though. That's the only thing. I love doing that. I just went through like a blade uh, binge watch of the the movie series like yesterday, and just laid on the floor with my wireless mouse and wireless keyboard, and was just like, "Wow!" Uh, it does <laughs> make life time. a little easier. It does. It does. Oh, the Western life. <laughs> I I went on this weird blade fetish yesterday. I was like, I gotta watch Blade again, and Blade Two, not Blade Three though. Well, if we're talking Blade, I skipped over that. Did you uh, did you make sure and watch that uh, short run Spike series? I only saw a couple of episodes, and I was like, eh. It was very not, meh. I wasn't, yeah, I was just like, yeah, and you know, it's not as stylish as the as the the movies, the first two movies. Oh no, not at all. It wasn't the first one was way stylish. In fact, you know what? The first one was more style than action, even when you look back at it. You're like this isn't this wasn't as action packed as you th thought it was for as good as it was. It was just really stylish. It was really cool. The I would agree with that statement. More. Yeah, I loved it. I love how they they used to do that though. You know, that was the whole like when um, <clears throat> even movies like uh, Black Mask with Jet Li in it, in movies like that. It was all style. I loved that. There's something about it. But then again, <clears throat> when you don't have uh, like kind of underground hip hop and, and drum and bass and stuff. It's hard to do it. <laughs> Very hard. But yeah, I I uh I, I miss miss movies like that. But then again you gotta understand like I have shit taste in movies. Like absolutely shit taste in movies. I I mean I like good movies here and there, but like when it comes to like my list of favorite movies, it's it's insanely stupid. <laughs> And nothing wrong with that. There's some really, really good bad movies. And anymore, that's about the only place you're going to find a movie that's worth anything. 
sadly I enjoyed enough. the old Captain America. <laughs> wow, that that is really I bad, like, actually. You know, bravo. It that's, is. That's a, that's an atrocious film. Last... It's true. It's true. But uh, I enjoyed it. I I, I like um. I like the the real special effects. <laughs> I like masks and shit. So I like watching that. It's it's cool. I liked um I even liked the old Punisher. That was a cool one too. Uh the Dolph Lundgren Dolph one. Lundgren in it. Yeah. It's yeah. really not terrible. I mean it's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a not, lot it's, it's not a masterpiece. No. <laughs> no, but I mean it's not as bad as people put it out to be. I mean it gets a lot no. more uh, flack than it kind of deserves. Probably just because of Dolph cool. Lundgren and the just swath of movies he was doing at the time. Yeah, it's true. But I think he was a pretty cool Punisher. He was a pretty cool Frank Castle, I thought. Yeah, he wasn't bad. Uh, I mean, uh, no. you could do so, so much worse. I mean, you he could did. do a lot better. I mean, every casting <laughs> since then has been pretty much on point. But Yeah, I, I, I liked aesthetically the movie. I, I thought aesthetically it was pretty cool. Yeah. And, of course, to have the Yakuza edit and everything, that was pretty cool, too. Also, it's a I product of the times awesome. that it's in, too. You know, you have to take anything in its uh, cultural place. It's true. I even have shit taste in comic books. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really easy right now. I mean, they're basically almost all terrible, so. I I am the worst offender. I love 90s comic books. Oh, okay. That's well, then, favorite. actually, that's that's not that bad. That's actually when they were good. I think so too, but they're right now in the uh, the comic book circle world of of things. The '90s is the, the consensus for the '90s was that they were they were terrible, the worst decade of of comic books, and the industry was at its lowest, and they were just mass producing, and, and it was all tits and ass and shit. And well, I don't know. There was, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's also when some of the some real modern classics came out. You know, Spawn came out in the '90s. Or uh, true. Well, the, the Max. Independent, that huge independent boom that just happened. Yeah, in Image. The 90s. Image in the 90s. Exactly. Image, Valiant, Dark Horse were, or of course, Dark Horse was, you know, around. But yeah. still, all of them boomed. And it was great. It was a time when you go to a comic book store and people are actually buying in mass non Marvel comics, non Marvel, yeah. and, and sometimes non DC, except when we get to Vertigo. That was awesome stuff. Oh but, um, yeah, Vertigo in the '90s yeah. was that was magic. That was it. That was it. As my favorite comic book series ever is the Invisibles. I, I love. I was that, actually going to mention that uh, while, when you were talking about language specifically. That's exactly uh, that ties That's in a very great well. Example. As a perfect example, perfect example of of exactly what we were talking about. I loved that series. I think that series was magic. No pun intended. That was right. uh, a very magical series. Uh, I loved it, and um, <clears throat> every so often, every year, I, I go back and I and I have it on my tablet now. So I just go back and like I'll take a whole day and just read the whole series again. I love it; absolutely great. Shout out to King Mob. Indeed, indeed, indeed. <laughs> but yeah, I I thought I thought the '90s was pretty cool. Um, when it came to uh, to comic books and stuff, Wildcats. I liked Wildcats, man. I mean, people hated on Wildcats even, and I'm like, why? I loved it. It was awesome. Come oh, on. that was uh, was that the Image team up deal? Yeah, that was. It was, no. a, of course, it was a flop, but uh, I liked it. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, didn't did Image do Gen 13, or was that another company? I think they did. I think they did. Don't quote me on that, but that sounds that sounds right to me. Actually, yeah, and that so one was kind of okay. That was like their take on the X Men. It was obviously a little bit more edgy and you know, just more imagey because that's what they did. Like take whatever's going yeah, I, on, throw a little bit of edge on it, and then send it out there. I love that. I love that. That was so cool. And even video games were trying that out when they were doing franchises. You know, if it wasn't X Men, you know, right? They would try to make it more edgy too. They even had a Wildcat Super Nintendo game actually. It was horrible but it was you know it's fun to play for a minute just to go back and see it but it was horrible it was a bad game but even you know even maximum carnage uh, for sega and, and snes and uh a couple other games like that they were even edgy even for marvel characters it was pretty cool you know it would be interesting to see uh see some indie studios try and bring some of those back yeah it's it's gonna come up 
eventually. Well, we'll I mean, it will. Yeah. Right now, we're going into the uh, basically just the real classic genres, you know, racing game. The only basically, there's Hotline Miami. There's a couple racing games that are going to be coming out, and there's uh, Blood Dragon. Those are really the uh, the games that evoke that '80s ethos. There isn't a lot yeah. more right now. As a matter of fact, I'm no. uh, going to be doing a playthrough of Blood Dragon after I uh, finish out Hotline Miami. Nice, nice. I'm going to start doing some... Really cool, really cool game. It's uh, Half of it is all like glowing neon. I'm going to start doing some Let's Plays, I think, on, on the Deep Web Music YouTube channel <clears throat> of some old games. But I think, yeah, we're digesting the 80s again. And um, it's like culturally humans the human zeitgeist it culturally digests like a cow <laughs> so it has like four stomachs and <laughs> right now we've like spit up the cut of the 80s now we're chewing on that right now and then when we swallow that the 90s will come back up and things will get darker and, and, and edgier again i think it's it, we're ripe for that cyberpunk is making a comeback even as an aesthetic and, and different things but the problem is the fucking internet <laughs> it's the internet has ruined some shit like that, though, because people, everyone's a fucking expert now. So, like, it gets oh, ruined. Yeah. If you if you go into like a cyberpunk group on Facebook or something to try to catch up on what's going on with it or anything like that, it's full of fucks that are just. Is this fucking cyberpunk? This is not cyberpunk. Listen, this is more political punk. Uh. It's, it's just, it just gets fucking ridiculous. And, I'll pass um, on that. Exactly. It's, you know, I always give this metaphor to uh, to people. It's like pro wrestling in the '90s when it uh, when it became edgy, the Attitude Era, and uh, when that happened, that was awesome. But that was really because you know the internet was coming up and people were starting to get pretty in the know about all of the secrets of wrestling, and they wanted to see the inside secrets more because they knew about it. And so they, they changed everything up to that, and they kept evolving with it. But then there was this point where your entire audience were just people who knew everything already. And then the stagnation happened. And I think that's um, – and, of course, it, it spikes and it peaks and falls you know, ever since then because it was a long time after the 90s. But I think that's exactly kind of a metaphor for a lot of art forms. And, you know, it's <clears> – <throat> once you get this – kind of circle of people that circle jerk each other with how much they know about something it just destroys the magic of, of an art form of some kind I hate that I really don't want to see that happen to uh, to the synthwave scene I mean eventually it'll come oh, it, it will oh, it's happened just already. the nature of things oh, oh it's happened already it's <laughs> it's happened already with the um with the fan side of it, 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 the magic is still there. There's still magic in, in the air for the fan side of Synthwave. But being on the on the inside of the producer level of things, it it has the disease has already hit, and it's way sick with with that type of ethic and stuff. Um, there's That's there's a core sad. of people in Synthwave. It is it is it's very sad. There's a core of people of producers who really want to try to keep that. Um, that magic alive and i think there's kind of a divide between both groups of people that want to do that and how they want to do it one wants to do it by keeping it super positive um if not almost to a fault if not even almost to a fault of superficiality um no attacking it's just a, it's an honest criticism and um <clears throat> you have that or and then you have this other side which are more revolutionary about it they really want to converge it with other things and try to to kind of push it almost like an attitude era <laughs> almost like there's going to be a stone cold coming out for uh for synth <laughs> i think karate king um the uh producer and record label boss of karate king records mm. uh my friend i think he he tried to do that at first he he attempted to he attempted synth wave from that standpoint like he was vince mcmahon and i i I fell in love with that, that approach. I love that. I'm like, this is it. I mean, this is performance art. This is what this is supposed to be anyways. Sure. This is not, um, you know, I don't know what. This is not eighth grade poetry. This is this is a performance that people like, and they're entertained by it, and this is a great approach to it. But he was met with 
hatred. <laughs> he was met with a lot of hatred from within the scene, not from from fans. There's a lot of fans who love what he does and what he pushes out. But that's that kind of happened with that too. And he was kind of seen as a poison to the scene when really he he wasn't a poison at all. He was just trying to bring a new era into yeah, something. And I personally like, don't have a problem with that at all. And as a matter of fact, I don't know if I'd call him a friend of mine, but I mean, we talk and I put his stuff up on my show. So, you know, I'd, I'd certainly call him an associate and a guy that I think is pretty cool. So, you know. Yeah, he's, he's awesome. He's awesome. He's um, right now working on a, uh, like a serial, like this, this kind of literary serial. Hmm. And um, <clears throat> yeah, it's very fascinating. I'm, I'm way with him on it. I'm like, yeah, you got to do that. I think the thing with with that guy is that he he honestly is trying to push things along, not because he thinks he's the leader of something, but rather because I think he has his own standards for things. I don't think he's an elitist. I don't think he thinks his standards are better, but I think he has his own standards, and I think he's trying to raise it to his standards of some kind and i can completely understand that um you know absolutely i was a i was actually assigned artist to a karate king records for a while so i mean i i completely agree with his his approach to things with the uh the label that i made it was a completely different take on things because we we we're taking the the road of interscope records <clears throat> essentially where okay. Interscope in the 90s had all these different acts. They were from different uh, disciplines and genres of music, but the aesthetic was kind of the same. They were all edgy. You know, everybody on it was edgy. They had edgy rappers. They had edgy, they had Marilyn Manson. You know, TVT Records was a subsidiary of Interscope, and they had all these different um, groups like that. And that was kind of, that's kind of what deep web music is, is going to be. It's, it's different genres. We have uh, just now a synthwave artist who just signed on, uh, Crystal Bear, He'll be putting out his EP on the 20th, actually, 420. Oh, and, nice. Um, Happy yes, birthday, Hitler. And, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing is, is that we the reason why we're even putting on 420 is because he's doing this kind of stoner doom metal approach to Synthwave. Oh, cool. So I thought it was kind of a – it was subtle. It's a subtle you know, glance to, to the, the 420 pot reference and all that good stuff. But – it is um it's still somewhere in that genre of things so yeah i think uh deep web music is trying to do some something a little different I, well i think karate king records changed up a little bit too he started getting a lot more vaporwave people let me adjust my mic real quick I'm yeah you're getting a little let's try that out okay yeah you're Whoa. clearer now okay good you said clear or clipping no no you're clear you were getting okay, kind of cool. muddy a bit ago but yeah i think um we have we have that and we have also have a synth pop guy named aaron shadro who's going to be coming out too uh pretty soon with his ep or not ep i'm sorry full album hey Hopefully what a great segue day. let me just uh pop up the uh there are so many people in my head we'll play that in the background nice. as we continue uh can you talk nice nice there we go this is uh aaron shadro there are so many people in my head and uh shazam you know he is he's actually just 17 years old oh really and, um, yes he's a very prescient voice uh for, for his age and uh very very keen eye on composition oh yeah i remember we talked about um what uh might be done as far as affecting the uh effectors on the song to get it looking a little more balanced yes and I have actually, I, I I believe I have a finishing product now for it. And excellent, it's, uh, excellent. I, ra I ran it through um, I ran it through a tape machine emulator, and then I ran it through a real tape deck. Oh, nice. <laughs> so I really got the analog feel to it now. Nice. And fixed it. Oh yeah. Once so, I get yeah, that together, I, uh, feel free to send me any uh, any new tracks or anything. I'll be happy to showcase them. Oh, I will. Do. Absolutely. In fact, I'll be sending you uh, Crystal Bear's uh, new single called Howl and Fang, uh, and that's coming out soon, too. I'll be coming out 420, actually. The whole EP is called Oberon, nice. and uh, it's a three-part concept album. So it's going to be two EPs and an LP. 
So the first is an EP, the second album is going to be a full release, and the third one's going to be another EP. It's a pretty uh, ambitious little thing he's doing. Ambition is a fine this... thing. We need people that uh, really want to go out there and grab it. You know, uh, I'd like to see this scene take off of its own, as opposed to get grabbed up by um, the more corporate interests and made into something that it oughtn't be. Yeah, I think they're going to have a chance to do that pretty soon because Vaporwave is going to be, I think, picked up. Yeah, Vaporwave is the one that's really hitting. I mean, you can kind of see it and feel it hitting and coming oh, yeah. in on the edges of popular culture. Exactly. I think it's it, it'll be a good chance for that scene to kind of pick itself back up and uh, revamp some things and figure out where they want to go with the, the music. <clears throat> There will always be a core of people that want classical, which is kind of funny to say, but classical synthwave. And I think there will always be people who will make classical synthwave. But I think there's going to be a few people that will push the scene along on its own pretty soon. Uh, it's all going to happen when the performances really come in. Yeah. That's when it really will hit, you know. And that's what's starting to happen. They're starting to get real performers, not just, you know, and there's nothing wrong with it, but not just dudes with a turntable. Yeah. Who, you know, are essentially coming up and saying, I produced this, let me let me play this now. I think you're gonna start seeing and not these huge also these huge scales, but I think you're gonna start seeing guys like Chrome Brulee, who is a in my opinion, I'm in love with that group. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of them before. Uh no, first I've heard of it. I would check them out if I were you. They're out of Europe. I, I think they're French, but I'm not sure. But they're called Chrome Brulee and they're amazing. They're actually a I think a four or five part band. And they do synthwave, but they do it live. They do it with instruments. Oh, nice. And it's very fascinating. Yes, it's uh, those guys, it's a shame that they don't have the love that they deserve because those guys are really doing it. They're doing what you're, what, they're doing it. You know, they're out there performing it. They're really playing with their hands, the music. They have synthesizers. They have guitarists. They have a bassist. They have a drum, drum sequencer, a, a programmer, and drummer. It's, I mean, it's really good stuff. And they have really good promotional stuff, too. So, I mean, yeah, check those out. Check a Chrome Brulee out. Amazing yeah, I've stuff. got a link up here. I'll definitely check them out here in a minute. Uh, there's... Uh, not Kavinsky. There's somebody that's doing live shows that really, really throws it down. Let me see if I can uh, find him in my list of uh, my library here. Not Flash Arnold. Flash Arnold is awesome. That is some good stuff. Uh, Laserhawk. Oh man, I really enjoy his stuff. Uh, not oh, him. I don't course. know if he's doing anything live though. Of course, Laserhawk. There's a there's a hilarious meme. You know that meme that has um, uh, Wayne Newton. Wayne Newton. I forgot his name anymore. But the guy who the, the fat guy in uh, Jurassic Park, the hacker. Yeah, yeah, I know. What you, you're know about. you know where. You, the scene in the movie where he's like, uh, we got a da 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 here, we got a da 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 here. See, no one cares. Um, he, there's a meme where he says, uh, synthwave here, synth new synthwave album, new synthwave album here. See, if it's not Laserhawk, no one cares. Like, <laughs> oh, Calm Truce. <laughs> Calm Truce, of course, of course. Yeah, uh, his Calm live, came he is able to put together this stuff live, and it is amazing. Yes, Cla that's that's that uh, that one-man classical approach. You know that 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 is completely dead, and there's so so few people that that can pull that off. But you you know what? A lot of synthwave guys are ex guitarists who have found some uh, some kind of dispassion in their style of music in their scene, and they move to this because it's new and it's fresh. And there's no I don't have anything wrong with that, but a lot of them do that, so they don't come from it from the stance of keyboard playing in in, in a high level. You gotta have that. You gotta have someone who really feels comfortable with a keyboard to be able to pull that off. Honestly, the person I would want to really jump into a synthwave scene would be somebody that played keytar in the early '90s. I mean, of course, that there would be actually, you that know would what? be it. There's a guy, and I mentioned him before. Um, his name is Anders. His first name, but his his name is a uh, I think it's Democles, but I'm not sure. It's uh. 
uh, da, da, da. it's spelled like the Mockles, but I think it's pronounced Democles. And um, he is a, a Swedish producer that actually had a studio in the 80s and ran his own studio in the 80s um, and early 90s. And he plays guitar and he makes, I mean, he makes the real deal music. You know, it's not just modern synthwave. He makes the real deal throwback stuff. Uh, because he actually made that stuff back in the day when he owned his own studio. And it was a real full studio, like a real big one when studios were studios, you know. Nice. And he's, he's doing that. He just came out with an album called, um, blah, 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 what's it called, Ozone Surfer or Surfing the Ozone Layer or something like that. Something to do with ozone and surfing. And that's a, a pretty good representation of, of that style. Ozone too. Kite Surf? No. No, that's that's just actually an actual thing. Weird. Look up, uh, I think it's I think it's D A M O K L E S. I think he is his name. Uh, ozone is... surfing, yeah. Ozone surfing, yeah. That's I think that's his latest release, and um, yeah, he he does he does all that stuff like that too. Takes a bunch of pictures with keytars uh, and and you know he has a real ear real keen ear for that old style of, of that music he, you know he came out from in that era oh man he's got an yeah. epic guitar too i know he right it's, it's nice ass. wow <laughs> yeah he's he he does uh, some great great work as well i would definitely uh start trying to pimp out his material <laughs> i made a couple of mixtapes uh that i released under the label before i ever had any artists on the label and uh, he was always a go-to for one of them because he always made real upbeat, synth-wavy, dancey stuff too. You could tell it was just you could tell that he had he had soaked up that era, and he was full of it. Oh, you know, that's like he wonderful! Was able to just express it out. That's the kind of people that we really need to be getting out there. You know, um, well, somebody like that, like a uh, like a Joe Satriani of uh, you know synthwave, somebody that was there and can make the really out exactly. there stuff because they've seen all the mainstream stuff. Exactly. It's it's the little things, you know, when you're mixing and mastering and producing in a big studio like that, that really you can't um, you can't reproduce unless you did it. You know, just little things. Yeah, no. He made he even he even made that early 90s, you know, upbeat uh, not house music, but that upbeat electronic almost synth wavy stuff too. You know, with the impact, the impact hits, or the orchestra impact hits, and stuff like that, and that real upbeat drum, that um, the drums that sound like they're on uh, Toe Jam and Earl. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. He essentially made that. He made like fuller, fuller, serious versions of, of Toe Jam and Earl type stuff uh, in the early '90s too. So yeah, very fascinating guy. I, I talked to him a few times, and uh, he's he's quite a fascinating character when it comes to that. And uh, he's great for interviews because he speaks perfect English. Really? Yes. I'll have to uh, I mean, look him uh, up. See if we can maybe get one for the uh, one for the station. Yeah, here. I can even um, I can even ask him for you if you want me to. to oh, that'd be you, great. Uh, yeah, absolutely. That'd be yeah. wonderful. Yeah, he's he's a he's a trip to uh, to interview. Actually, he's very funny and he's very um, uh, very animated and uh, like I said, speaks perfect English. A lot of Scandinavians speak perfect English though but his is really good <laughs> excellent i'll take it guys from the netherlands always speak like perfect american english they always do you barely can tell that they're, they're not even from america I'm not yeah they put pretty good metal out there too oh of course oh yeah yeah it's all that it's all that norse blood <laughs> indeed indeed some of them haven't uh had all of it completely bred out of them Try as they might. <laughs> they have, they've been they've been Christianized. <laughs> oh, well, anymore. It doesn't even look like um, that's the one laying greatest siege on the uh, the West. But that's a deeper topic for a, a longer day. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah, I um, I've always been fascinated with with west europe's fascination with with norse 
Nordic culture and, and history and stuff like that. There seems to be kind of a, now I'm saying everybody in West Europe, but there, there seems to be a little bit of a consensus of, of hearkening back to that. It's strange. It's strange to me because I don't have any connection to it. I guess that's why it's strange to me. Yeah. But uh, I don't I don't come from any anybody that's uh, from that part of the world, I guess you'd say, from any, any Nordic heritage or anything like that. I think I've got a little you in the think? background. I've got uh, I've got a little bit of everything and uh, like some there's some I think Cherokee and another tribe in there. Um, a little bit of everything from Europe, nothing from Africa, and nothing from Asia. The the Cherokee were fascinating people. They were oh, fascinating yeah. people altogether. Um, they were like the diplomatic empire <laughs> of the Americas. At well, in all honesty, there were, um, how do we say, uh, pre-Columbian times, there were, um, it is said that there were cities and uh, a sprawling empire across the whole of the USA, or, well, what would have been now the USA, and, uh, oh, what was it, about 80% uh, of the population got killed off by uh, diseases they were completely unprepared for oh yeah i mean you know the fascinating thing is is that had the cherokee or really all the nations of indians in, in north america at the time had they actually had the real population up and running as they were used to for centuries yeah i mean their history would have been completely different in america completely different uh, you would not have been able to just jump off a boat and, and come after them no not, not at, all. at all not even <laughs> remote <laughs> to, to, yeah, too many angry, angry people who don't want you there, um, armed to the teeth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and even if you're dealing you with, imagine... uh... oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you just imagine what would happen if they took your weapons then. <laughs> then they take your weapons, they take them back, they figure out what gunpowder is, and then boom, you're done. You're done. You're done well, yeah. now. <laughs> well, you can just look at, uh, look at what happened in the 80s with Russia and Afghanistan. Exactly, exactly. Kind of look at what's happening now in Afghanistan. <clears throat> anyway. Well, you know, that's exactly how uh, Mao Zedong actually grew an army. It was the exact same way. It was using these kinds of hit-run-hide tactics and then taking the weapons and then going back and then stockpiling them until you got enough to make units and then go after people, you know, and then take their ammo and everything else. That's exactly how a country as large as China was. Uh, the, 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 that whole revolution started that way it's fascinating how so some people in this world can do something with nothing and, and something on a, such a large scale even though he was a complete whack job once he finally sat in power <laughs> yeah true complete now i mean yeah. i will give credit uh, some credit where credit's due i mean without um some of the uh well, i guess you'd say programs we wouldn't have some of the medical advances we do today, but, you know, it's kind of scary stuff. But um, an interesting little story on that particular thing, uh, the cure to malaria existed uh, from roughly the 30s, I believe. Not long after the Cultural Revolution in China, uh, they were having a lot of trouble with their soldiers dying of malaria, and there was a, uh, there was a treatment in traditional Chinese medicine, the bark of some particular tree, uh, they took that, and uh, the scientists that they hadn't killed off, they uh, sent it to them to study and said, here, uh, figure out how this works. Well, actually, they said, we need a cure to malaria, and so they did their research by looking through old text, found this, that it actually worked for it, and came up with a cure from there. And that's where a lot of our um, scientific method for finding cures for these things now come from, you know, from those early endeavors. But that didn't come out, I think until the 70s, like well after uh, we had gotten out of Vietnam, basically, and what was it? We were using DEET, I think, at the time for our guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't surprise me one bit. Uh, I mean, the, the pharmacopoeia in China is, is insane. It's so huge. There's so many exclusive plants. All also. those poor bears with no more paws or balls. Right, and tigers. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Tigers and deers, anything that's got a dick, pretty much, got yeah. it chopped off and ground up. <laughs> oh yeah, all those rhinos. I'm telling you. But you gotta, you know, it's weird. Some of it's superstition, of course, but 
it's it, you gotta respect the audacity of a people who are like, we're not even going into plants. We're gonna cut up this animal and say there's medicine in it. That's pretty fascinating if you well, think about it. <laughs> well, you look at their um, traditional Chinese medicine works. It does. I mean, it, there's uh, some bits that modern medicine could certainly supplant. And uh, what am I looking forward here? Uh, not supplant, uh, assist, I guess. Uh, there's a better word, but I can't think of it. But, you know, the two could work uh, synergistically. Ha <laughs> ha, buzzword. <clears throat> but, it's uh, true, though. It's absolutely true. Yeah, like uh, chiropractic, when it was uh, initially a thing, was patently ridiculous. They they said you could fix anything from a cold to a to well, an they aneurysm. <laughs> they still do. They still say that. Uh, some of them They'll do. Still... Some of them are pretty reasonable, though. They say that uh, you know they approach it as a, a holistic thing. You know, you do this. This is going to fix anything to do with basically your nervous system being bound up or your uh, skeletal system being screwy or your tendons and that's all reasonable those are all things that are specifically going to be touched on and modified by that you know you're not necessarily going to be able to cure a person who's got glaucoma i mean it's patently ridiculous doesn't stop them right. from saying you might try but you know it is what it is yeah i mean don't get me wrong i think um Personally, I mean, I, I've actually, I actually subscribe to uh, uh, Dr. John Sarno's uh, research with uh, people who have uh, phantom illnesses. I guess you could say, like, uh, or what? Not phantom in the sense that it's fake, but phantom in the sense that it's hard to to pin down what exactly is going on with someone, like uh, things like fibromyalgia and things like that. Oh, like Morgellons uh, up until just recently. Yes, and he he thought. And he, he theorized that it was really had to do with both the the postural and emotional makeup of people that were um, suffering from this, and that a lot of it was um, a lot of unresolved issues, a lot of anger, a lot of um, – and it wasn't because they had it inside their mind and it was there and it was doing something bad to them. It was that it was causing them to hold muscle patterns and, and, and move muscle patterns in a certain way to where – eventually uh, their bodies would break it would you, you know you their hips would uh, invert a little bit they wouldn't have mobility um, then they would start to be more sedentary and then they would get sick and then they would you know things would just start going wrong exponentially from there so you know he kind of gets poo-pooed away by saying well that's the guy who said that uh, repressed anger is what causes uh illnesses and that's not what he said at all he's he's a real doctor he's not a quack by any means um he had a lot of research to back it up actually and he had a lot of patients who were like you know i went everywhere to every healer in the world every doctor and th this is the only guy that that taught me to not have this pain anymore and uh, i subscribe a lot to that so i mean i think any any discipline could could hit the right spot if they're messing with uh, the posture and structure of your body and your muscles and things like that I definitely do if I don't um, if I don't lift weights you know for more than two weeks first of all my emotional makeup goes insane and then my physical makeup just goes insane after that too I mean it never fails I have to have that heavy weight the right postures and the right structures and then pick it up and then I think it, I, for me it feels like it straightens everything out I love it I have to do it <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a nervous type of person anyway so I have to burn all that energy off every time sorry I'm having to uh, fix something that could have turned into a terrible uh, terrible dilemma I, I, <laughs> I tweeted out the, uh, the call link as opposed to the uh, link to the video <laughs> so let me just tweet out that instead because that's going to be much, much better. Okay. That's yeah. All right. Yeah, I did a um, I just did a podcast with um, PZA Pizza, the Pizza, if you will, um, a big vaporwave uh, vapor trap guy and um, he was a replacement for Thad McCracken actually um, who was supposed to be coming up there who was a, a kind of a 
mysticism shamanic modern day shamanic writer and uh, thinker. Oh, nice. I um, I <clears throat> had him scheduled, but then he had the time wrong. So I wrote to him after I sent him the the invite link. I wrote to him and I was like, "Hey, we'll just do it another time. I got another guest anyway, so don't worry about it." And then he popped in about thirty minutes later. And that's what happens when you have the links up. <laughs> right. Yeah. So probably better that I uh, get rid of that for now. Somebody just uh, sitting there just saying, uh, so I looked at it and was like, oh, yeah, no, no. The, uh, don't worry about the quality of it. It's fine right now. So I look at it. It's like, oh, crap. That says call. <laughs> so, yeah. So we're safe now. I'm sure it's been archived, and I'm going to get calls from people on Kiwi Farms eventually. <laughs> You like to buy a kiwi i have a farm full of them oh if only that was the kind of kiwis they were selling <laughs> oh it's a bad place bad place sir <laughs> if you think the chans are bad kiwi farms is where the rejects go when <laughs> yeah as, I, I, uh, I on that very I'm... note as a matter of fact I don't know if you uh, follow much of what's going on, but have you heard about this uh, girl from Nintendo that was fired recently, Allison Rapp? No, I have not. Well, <clears throat> the long and short of it is uh, she was uh, working at a company called Treehouse, which does localization for Nintendo, and they did a real, real crap job on uh, the Fire Emblem's Fates game that just recently got released. Absolutely right. trash. I, and I've heard the, the, the consensus on that, though. Yeah, I have. Yeah, that and they cut out something not... like 10 hours of gameplay by making it into a, you walk into the room, you walk out of the room, where you would have actually had discussions and interactions with characters. They just didn't even bother. But, oh, wow. uh, I mean, it's not even really something I'm super interested in, but it's kind of a shitty way to treat a, a beloved property, as it were. But all said, basically, uh, she was a member of that, and well, you don't really follow gaming either. So there was an incident not unlike this, uh, not long back, with a game called Mighty Number no. Nine that pulled in a lot of money from Kickstarter, mm -hmm. and uh, that was meant to be like a Mega Man successor, basically something a, a spiritual successor to Mega Man by the uh, the original creator. Okay. They hired uh, this woman by the name of Dinah something or other, and she was um, probably the worst person you could hire to be the head of your American PR. She was abusive towards the customers, um, the people that had backed it. She would uh, block them on Twitter and on, on the uh, official forums. The company could do no wrong, and she was also one of these individuals pushing this uh, progressive narrative in places where it genuinely has no place. You know, I don't right. honestly, I don't care for progressives, but I don't have a problem with them. There's a lot of good that's to be made with progress. This is the nature of progress. But you can go too far really really quickly i feel the same way i mean i can um i can I, I can spiritually agree with uh being uh progressive i guess you could say yeah but i do completely understand what you're saying um when it comes to um it, to me it feels like micromanaging talking points that uh when there's bigger ones involved you know when there's with like when it comes to women's issues, especially you know, and I, I tread lightly because I'm I'm obviously not a woman, but right. When it comes to that, it seems to me that other parts of the world, women are are essentially sold as property, um, and they're killed as, as property, and and they're sex traded as property. That's a big deal. I think that would be a, a big issue to really stand against and to really put as much time as you can into um, uh, being making people aware of that. If that was your real, if that was your real passion, uh, 
Well, absolutely. I don't know Just if... look at uh, Saudi Arabia today. I, I believe uh, women are chipped, microchipped, RFID chips. Yeah, I think that's more important than whether your nipples are on Instagram or not. <laughs> I feel like that. I mean, yeah. like I said, my perspective might be uh, skewed by my gender. Who knows? But I feel like uh, that's a bigger issue <laughs> than, than that. And I feel like that there's not a there's more time and energy put into something like that than there is the other stuff, you know, uh, like a woman in Pakistan. Like a, there's a woman in, in Karachi, Pakistan right now. I don't have to know her name. I don't have to know who she is. I can just go ahead and, and know right now that there was there is one. If one, there's a million that are essentially sold as a sex slave and their wills mean nothing uh, at all. You know, um, I like I said, I think that's a that's a major that's a bigger major issue because that's a human issue that that really puts a, a stain on our species uh, as, as anyone that wants to progress anything as a, as a human being. I think that's horrible. But absolutely, uh, you know to put all this time into hashtagging something else that has nothing to do with that, that are first world people. Um, yeah, these know things, that, you know? there are real issues out there and there are real problems that need solutions as opposed to, uh, you know, trying to tackle these issues. Well, you know, you have people going after, uh, what's, what's one of the most recent outrages? Um, I don't know. Nothing comes to mind right Name now. I, There's so many. Yeah, it's <laughs> There's just. There's so many. <laughs> I, I can't remember a specific one because they just keep happening. It's like a deluge. I don't know here. It let me just let me head. just type Google social justice and I will come up with something terrible. I can guarantee it. <laughs> see, and you know, yeah. the sad thing is that you never really know if these are major movements or is this a micro movement done by a, a small group that has a huge you know um claim of real estate on the internet that's the other problem to never you never know um because you can look a lot bigger on the internet than you really are and that's that's a major problem as well absolutely well, you know people you think that they're a lot more important than uh than they are and that they have a lot more reach and that they matter when they don't matter a damn sight well it's true Internet real estate is always maybe in the in the future when we have virtual reality, but right now internet real estate is still cheaper than real real estate, <laughs> cultural real estate in, in real life. It's still a lot cheaper, you know. It's it, it's so expensive to get any kind of um, power in in cultural real estate in real life, you know. It takes a lot of work. Here we go. Of, uh, Here we go. Greek Week events canceled after members painted pro-Trump messages on free speech wall. And on that wall, it looks like they uh, did an impromptu uh, flag with, instead of uh, stars, they put uh, white elephants. And it says, build the wall, Trump 2016. And that that got the whole thing canceled. So, But that's obviously a troll. I mean... <laughs> or even if it's not, I mean... It's a it's a I wall. Mean, Just paint over it. it it's a graffiti wall. That's true. what they're there for. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's you know, I see worse shit on a overpass. <laughs> to be quite honest, I, I see much worse shit on an overpass when I'm driving under it. Yeah. <laughs> I see fuck your mother and shit like that <laughs> on a wall when I'm passing somewhere um, or anything like that. Yeah, it's. It, it's so crazy. I, I, like I said before, it's um, it's a weird, it's a weird game we get into when we start talking about a language and and what what we think is powerful language and what we think it isn't powerful language. In the sense of, if someone says something, is that, you know, it's like this. If I, if I was, um, if I was African American, I would never want someone to call me an n-word that i think that would be a given i don't think i'd ever want someone to do that um i think that uh it's really inconsiderate obviously and i think it's there's parts beyond being just rude uh to it as well sure um but these things aren't that is it i mean these this is just somebody 
50-50% or 50% they they might be a troll. The other 50% they're being sincere in claiming that their candidate is going to do a good job when they win. And that's really the message of what's being said. I there, think that there's my nothing wrong with that. You know, well, I mean, well, you, you say that well, about any other candidate, you know, Hillary 2016, Bernie 2016, no riots. Right. Say Trump 2016, a, we need to burn everything down. But then again, you can you can blame people with money for that, like, uh, you know, folks like George Soros and all that lot. And there's a name that's probably going to draw a bunch of views in here. <laughs> oh, no, still I one. think. Still. <laughs> God bless I you, think that, uh, fair viewer. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think um, I think this kind of surface level politics talk that happens everywhere is just that. And I think it's dangerous because once we make that the the style, then we're not we're not engaging in any kind of politics at all, are we? None of us are. Oh yeah, you we're, don't even now, you don't even touch on the real politic. It's all just bluster and uh, oh, what's exactly what's the term? Uh, bread and circuses, bread and circuses. Exactly, that's our was it pensera et circensis? I think it's something like that. Yeah, indeed. That's, exactly, exactly. And to me, I think. Um, I think we, we as an as a country, and I'm sure other people in other countries might agree as well. We dropped the ball when it came to communication between uh, candidates. I mean, we, we, our debates are jokes. They're, they're, I I don't know if I would say that we dropped the ball. I would say that the ball was knocked out of our hands by those with the at the <laughs> reins. But uh, the ball hit the ground either way. It could. I mean, I'll agree with you to an extent and say this. I think that. The, what was sold to people was some stupid shit and they bought it. Oh, um, and not only that, you know, what uh, what ended up on that bill of sale isn't exactly all that was sold to us in addition. It's true. Very true. It's absolutely true. I think um, <clears throat> I think one thing is, is that I, I, I think it's hard for Americans to see the linear timeline of American politics. I, I really do. I really think it's hard to even get anyone to consider whether something changed after a, a presidential administration and it had nothing to do with their party politics. I, I think it's hard for Americans to even see that, to even consider it. And I don't, you know, here's the thing, I don't say it's bad that they don't agree with me. It's not that, it's just that it's hard to get anyone to even consider whether or not something is correct or not. Like we can look at politics and we know for a fact that post Nixon things changed, that they, they changed very much. It has nothing to do with whether or not he was Republican or not. It has nothing to do with, with anything to do with that. It has everything to do with that, that person's administration changed things forever and things 